Hey everybody, this is a response to one of the more common criticisms that I've been receiving in the Philosophical Failures series. And in particular, we're going to take a hard look at Platonic realism or just simply Platonism. Now, I make a lot of claims in these videos, and there's plenty of topics worth elaborating on in more detail. So I'm actually kind of surprised that Platonism, of all things, would turn out to generate the intense response that it did. Not just from the comments, but from actual personal messages from people telling me how wrong they think I am on this issue. So realistically, there's probably not that many folks out there who seriously support Platonism, but the ones that do support it seem to really take it almost personally when you bash on their pet philosophy. So my goal for this discussion is to just show how completely misguided Platonism is, because there's really no excuse for holding to this view given our understanding of mathematics. To begin, let's define Platonism itself. Now, technically, when I say Platonism, I should probably say mathematical Platonism, since mathematics is the context that brought this up in the first place. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to call this Platonism, since the general essence is basically the same anyway across the board. Now, the definition you see here is taken straight out of Stanford's online encyclopedia of philosophy, which identifies three core claims for mathematical Platonism. First, there are, in fact, mathematical objects that exist. Second, mathematical objects are abstract, meaning they, they don't necessarily occupy a position in space and time or have mass. And third, mathematical objects are independent of intelligent agents and their language, thought, and practices. So if you think about it another way, even without people around to talk about these things, mathematical objects, and in particular numbers, would still literally exist. But not in the usual sense that most things exist. Rather, these abstract objects reside in a kind of special, transdimensional realm beyond space and time. And even though numbers don't occupy space or have mass, they still somehow manage to exert an influence over events within space and time. Now, it's important to realize that Christian apologists absolutely love this stuff, and with perfectly good reason. Because when Christians talk about God, they like to describe him as a being that exists out of the necessity of his own nature beyond space and time. Now, that's kind of a really obtuse description when you think about it. So naturally, you might be inclined to ask, well, if God is a thing that exists this way, what else exists that way? And interestingly, Christians do have a sort of prepared response, and usually what I'll hear is that abstract objects, like numbers of course, also necessarily exist beyond space and time. For example, William Lane Craig likes to make this exact argument when he defends the Kalam cosmological argument. So in a sense, Platonism is like a sort of philosophical springboard that Christians try and use to legitimize the idea of God himself and the sort of properties that he has. And if you ever get in a deep philosophical discussion with some Christian apologists, this topic is very likely going to just come up sooner or later, so you might as well understand the issue now before someone just blindsides you with this out of left field. Now, of course, the problem for Platonism is pretty straightforward. There's just no basis for this claim. And when you really think about it, it just betrays an almost embarrassing ignorance about the nature of mathematics. And to show why this is the case, we're going to go through a simple thought experiment that just illustrates perfectly what mathematics is. Now we begin by simply defining a mathematical set. And remember that in mathematical language, a set is nothing more than a collection of objects, maybe real, maybe imaginary, as determined by some made-up definitions. So for example, one possible set might simply be the set of all white socks in my drawer, and that would be a perfectly valid set. Another simple example could say the set of all possible moves in rock, paper, scissors. And again, that's a, that's a perfectly reasonable set. But today, I'm going to define my own set according to my own rules. However, I first need to give this set a name. So let's just call this set the set of all tribbles. So you see here, here's a set, and I've labeled it the tribble set. Remember that I'm free to define my set in terms of whatever arbitrary properties I want. So I'm going to define the set of all tribbles by the following properties. First, for the set of tribbles, there must exist an individual tribble element named Sally. Again, I could have called her her Rebecca, or I could have called her the Queen Tribble, but Sally is nice and simple. Therefore, whenever we speak of some collection of tribbles, Sally is going to play a role by definition. Next, for any given tribble element, there necessarily exists another tribble element called the mother of that tribble. 
Why, you ask? Well, simple. That's just what Star Trek canon says, of course. All Tribbles are supposedly born pregnant, so therefore I want all my Tribbles to have a mother that birthed them. It's my set, and those are the rules that I want to use. Now, you'll notice that the mother Tribble, being a Tribble herself, must also satisfy the properties of being a Tribble. So for any mother to some Tribble, there is also another mother to that Tribble as well. And if we visualize this relationship, we immediately see that we've defined this sort of never-ending chain of Tribbles. We begin with Sally, and then Sally has a mother, and Sally's mother also has a mother, who then also has a mother, and a mother, 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 and so on forever. Now, there's a key point to realize here, and that I'm just making shit up out of nothing. I just pulled all these rules and labels out of thin air. For example, I could have said that for every Tribble, there also exists a father Tribble and a mother Tribble. So maybe if we visualize that, you'd see this sort of branching binary tree kind of pattern. Or maybe I could claim that every Tribble has both a mother and a child Tribble. So here you'd see the chain extending forever in both directions. Uh, or better yet, I could have just as easily said that the entire set of Tribbles consists of a Tribble named Sally, a Tribble named Brenda, and a Tribble named Diana. Again, that's a perfectly valid set as well, and it's completely up to me to say which rules define the set of Tribbles. So I'm just going to stick with the rules given here. Now here's the big question for all of you Platonists out there. Are Tribbles an invention or a discovery? That is to say, do Tribbles exist in their own abstract trans-dimensional realm outside of space-time, or are they simply the product of my personal active imagination? Now seriously, stop and think about this for a minute. Because if your answer is yes, then in effect, any old arbitrary bundle of words and relationship that I just pull out of my ass must genuinely exist somewhere. But of course, that's just patently ridiculous. Of course they don't exist, I just made this whole thing up. So obviously the answer is just no, of course Tribbles don't exist. I invented them through pure wordplay, and that's fine. But the moment we concede that Tribbles, as defined here, don't exist, then I'm sorry to say you've just admitted that numbers don't exist either. Watch. I'm going to take the name Tribble, cross it out, and just replace it with the word natural numbers. Then we're going to take the name Sally and replace her with the word unity, as denoted with this little one symbol. Now take the relationship of mother and simply replace it with the term increment, and the set of natural numbers therefore consists of unity, the unity increment, the unity increment increment, the unity increment increment increment, and just so on and so forth forever. Now you'll notice that as we travel down this chain of natural numbers, it gets a little tedious to keep saying increment over and over again. So I'm going to start giving these things names according to a system which we'll call counting. Starting with the unity element, I'm going to simply label this as the natural number 1. So that 1 increment is then called 2. 2 increment we'll call 3. 3 increment is called 4, and so on and so on. Voila! We now have the standard set of natural numbers as defined by grade school mathematics. It's exactly the same as this set of tribbles that we came up with before, only all I've done is just scribble out the names and replace them with new ones. Now remember, again, I made this whole thing up out of nothing. I could have used different names and I could have used different rules, but I chose to use these names and these rules. And honestly, this is all that mathematics is. It's just a bunch of rules and definitions applied rigorously to their natural logical conclusions. And nothing more. And frankly, anyone who says otherwise just simply doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. So to reiterate the fundamental point, if numbers genuinely exist, then any bundle of rules and definitions that I make up must also exist. That's what we mean when we say that there's no more truth to mathematics than there is to hopscotch, poker, and chess. When you follow the rules of chess, then you're simply playing chess. And likewise, when you follow the rules of algebra, then you are simply doing algebra. Maybe there are times when you want to follow some other rules, and maybe you don't. But if you seriously want to argue that numbers exist, then you're also arguing that checkmates and full houses exist as well. There's just no philosophical difference between these systems. So, of course, that's, that's just silly. Of course we made them up, and no, they don't really exist without us. But let's go ahead and drive the point home even further, and suppose that numbers maybe really do exist. And how would you know this? How do you demonstrate the existence of an abstract object? For example, take the number 2. If 2 exists, then where is this 2 that you speak of? 
Now, I've made this challenge to Platonists before, and the best answer they usually have to offer is something like, here, here are two apples. Put some apples in a bucket, and there's your two. That is, there's some metaphysical essence of two that magically governs these apples just because you put them together in a bucket. And you can't really see it, but obviously it's there because we talk about it so intuitively, right? Well, no. I mean, just look at the grammatical structure of what you're saying. Because when you say, here are two apples, where is this two? And you know, that's not two, that's two apples. So, for example, look at uh, if I were to say, here are big apples, and I write that sentence alongside of it. Notice that this is an identical grammatical sentence. But big is an adjective, not a noun. So two in this context can't even be a noun either, because it's an adjective. Saying that two exists has no more linguistic meaning than saying big exists. Big is not a thing unto itself, but rather a descriptor of things. There is no big without things to ascribe bigness to. So to try and claim that two is an actual existing thing is exactly the same as claiming that big is a, is a thing. It's just incoherent. Two is not a thing, but a description of things. So again, the Platonist argument just falls flat on its face, because when I say, here are two apples, what I'm really saying is, here is an apple, and here is another apple. And if I say, here are three apples, what I'm really saying is, here is an apple, and an apple, and an apple. But again, you can see that talking this way is just tedious. So we'll just devise a simple convention that replaces these big, long sentences with something more compact and efficient. That is all counting is and all it ever was. It's just an invented convention for communicating information. This is exactly why we say that mathematics is invented and not discovered. Because the moment I demonstrate the actual invention process, the issue is settled. There's just nothing left to argue. There was no discovery in any of this except for the observation that communication tends to get really easy when we employ certain rules in our descriptive language about the world. So the Platonists, they're just wrong. And when they talk about numbers as existing, they, they literally have no idea what they're talking about. And frankly, I find it just embarrassing when so-called professional philosophers fail to recognize this, because this is not some deep philosophical mystery. As I said before, any decent high school textbook on algebra will admit openly that the whole process is based on axioms. And what's an axiom if not just a made-up rule that defines the process of doing algebra? So there you have it, all mathematics in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I would, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have in the comments section. So thank you for watching. Oh, what an awful dream! Ones and zeros everywhere! Ugh, and I thought I saw two. It was just a dream, Bender. There's no such thing as two.